And then the next talk will be by Chris Manza on gauges the breeders. Chris, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, hello, my name is Christopher Manza. And today I'm going to be talking about gaseous planetary disks around white dwarfs. And my aim is by the end of this talk, you'll have maybe as much or more appreciation of I, as I do of these systems and what we can use these systems to do to understand uh, white dwarf planetary systems better. And Eva gave a great introduction um, to this uh, topic, uh, but I just wanted to reiterate our, uh, on how we can deliver material to white dwarfs. So we know that 100% of white dwarfs are white dwarfs. But 25 to 50 percent of white dwarfs uh, show pollution in their atmosphere, which is delivered by a planetary system in some way. And I'm just showing kind of three examples of how we can pollute white dwarfs, uh, either through accretion or from a debris disk, uh, potentially direct impacts onto the white dwarf, uh, and possibly for the very hot white dwarfs, they could photo evaporate the giant planets in their system, and this material can eventually reach the white dwarf. Uh, but for the majority of this talk, I want to focus on accretion from debris disks. And that is, uh, these uh, are seen around one to 3% of white dwarfs. And they're usually detected by an infrared excess over the white dwarf SED. So if you look in the top right, you can see the kind of excess that this disk emission has over the white dwarf. And up until the last couple of years, these have mostly been modeled as optically thick, geometrically thin uh, disks that extend out to about a solar radius up to the Roche limit and then extend down to the dust sublimation limit where it turns into gas and this is what accretes onto the white dwarf surface. But there's been observations in the last few years that have kind of been throwing this into a bit of a tailspin and that we need more than just this optically thick component. And that's the variation that's seen in the dust emission from these disks. Um, one of the first observations was seen by Zhu and Jura in 2014, where over about 300 days, the infrared excess that was originally seen by this blue model and the triangle points dropped by about 35% in flux over this 300 day period to this kind of red uh, model and square points. And so there's already variability seen in these systems. And Swan et al has shown recently with WISE data that basically if we have enough signal to noise on these systems that all of these dust disks well, the ones that we have signal to noise for seem to show significant variability. And this is compounded by Spitzer observations, where as long as you observe your white dwarf for long enough and your disk debris disk for long enough, it shows increases and decreases in flux, um, infrared brightness, uh, with no preference on the increase or decrease. Uh, and the kind of the, the uh, faded points here are non-detections and the, the solid points are detections. And so this is hard to explain with an optically thick disk. Um, and you'd need some kind of optically thin component. And a kind of self-generated segue into my talk is that the largest dust disks, the, the dust disks that show the largest amount of variability also show emission from a gaseous component. And so about uh, five to 10% of uh, di debris disks show this gaseous component or about 0.1% of white, dwarf plan uh, white dwarfs in general. And we know that this gaseous component is largely co-orbital with the debris disks that we see. And this is thanks to their Kepler, the Keplerian rotation of the gas that's emitting these lines. So what I'm showing here is the kind of the first system that was discovered. This is the calcium triplet emission from uh, the disk, and it's nicely double peaked thanks to the rotation of the disk. So I have a disk up in the top right, and if you're looking up the page, then as this disk rotates counterclockwise, you can see the material uh, in green is orbiting tangential to us. So it has no radial, well, barely any radial velocity component and this sits in the center of the profile. Whereas the orange material, there's a lot of it and it's red shifted and moving away from us. And so this sits nicely in one of the peaks. And then as we move closer and closer towards the center of the disc, you have more uh, less and less material, sorry, but it's moving faster and faster. And so you get a nice drop off at high velocities. And this is of course reflected for the blue side of the disc. Um, you can already see some deviations from this in the profiles in that they're slightly red shift dominated. The red peak is higher than the blue peak. And this suggests that there is some asymmetry in the emission distribution in the disk. And so this disk was discovered 15 years ago, and we knew of seven such systems until about three or four months ago, where three teams led by Meles, Dennehy, and Gentil Fuselo uh, discovered 14 new systems, tripling the number of known systems of these emission disks. And I'm showing the 14 new systems here, and I hope you can kind of appreciate the diversity of these systems. Some are very narrow, some are very wide and shallow. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is um, these two. So um, this system here shows very symmetric uh, gaseous emission profiles, uh, but kind of on the opposite side, this system here 
shows very extreme emission profiles where the blue uh, shifted emission is basically contributing all the flux from this gas disk and there's barely any red shifted emission. So this disk is highly asymmetric. And what's more, the, one, the systems that show this asymmetry seem to show variations in the shape or morphology of these lines. So the, what the system I was showing earlier, we have much more monitoring of than these systems that were discovered very recently. And I'm just showing 13 years of spectroscopic uh, observations of this system and how the morphology has changed. So starting with the 2006 observation here, the uh, one I showed earlier, you can see it's kind of redshift dominated in its profile. And as we go through in time, you can see that the blue peak is very sharp and very narrow and then becomes dominant. The red peak starts to disappear and we get this nice uh, high velocity feature appearing like a little leg of the disk. And then in 2014, your, your peak is kind of completely disappeared. And eventually from 2017 to 2019, this emission, this red shifted emission profile resurges and becomes the dominant peak again. So this kind of back and forth between the profiles and kind of like the, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, kind of presence of this high velocity wing is kind of hard to, uh, it might be, it's kind of hard to conceptualize, but we've been able to model it relatively re uh, simply, sorry, I'll get my word models, relatively simply, um, that the gas itself is not changing in brightness or distribution. You have a, an eccentric disk, and what is ha happening is we're seeing the disk process. And the precession of the disk is giving us different radial velocity snapshots. And we can use these radial velocity snapshots to build up a 2D image of this disk. And that's what I'm showing here. So we have this 2D uh, velocity image produced via a method called Doppler tomography. And if you're looking up the page, as this disk processes, it's going to generate different emission profiles. And this can uh, model the variations that we see in these systems really well, getting the red to blue shift dot changes and also these high velocity components due to the disk being eccentric. And so this system has a precession period of about 25 years, uh, which is much, much faster than the orbital time scale on these disks, which is on the order of hours. So this pattern is stable and the precession is stable over many, many, many orbital cycles. And it's not just this system that shows this variability. This kind of morphological variability appears to be common in gaseous debris disks that show emission. I'm just showing three here as an example of all the kind of observations that have, well, not all of them, but some of them that have been taken. And I just want to highlight this system, HE1349-2305, um, that all these of these observations were taken in a time frame just over a year. And Dennehy et al. have shown that this system varies uh, on a period of about 1.4 years. So there's already this dynamic range in the kind of precession time scales we see in these systems. And I hope you can appreciate that the amount of uh, information that we can get just from these emission profiles. But it's not just emission profiles that we see that come from gas in these systems. So we see emission that is co-orbital with dust, but we also see absorption of gas with and without dust. So Deb this is showing a system that was identified by Debes et al. and has been more recently modeled with photoionization codes with, by Steele et al. And what this system is showing here, what this plot is showing here, is that we have a very large photospheric component that is the absorption from the material in the white dwarf atmosphere. But this material is redshifted as it sits in the gravitational well of the white dwarf. And what's showing here in this orange is a more subtle circumstellar feature that is sitting outside of this gravitational well and is no, not redshifted and so appears relatively blue shifted. And so what's happening here is instead of seeing the entire disk that we see with the emission profiles, we're seeing the thin sliver that is absorbing gas along a line of sight. And be, if you're in a circular orbit, you, are, you don't have any radial velocity, you're uh, orbiting tangentially. And so the variation, the kind of the only the RV shift you see is that difference due to the gravitational redshift. And this gaseous absor absorption has been seen in five systems so far. And in four of them, this kind of zero order, you're orbiting circular, so you only see the gravitational redshift um, seems to be uh, what's happening in these systems. All of these circumstellar emission uh, absorption profiles seem to be relatively blue shifted. But this isn't the case for one system, and that is WD1145 plus 017. And this is the first system to show transiting debris of a, a planetesimal that's orbiting on a four and a half hour period and is being ripped apart. And Zuatau in 2016 obtained this really nice spectrum of, of the white dwarf. And you can see in this spectrum, uh, the red profile is what you would expect from the white dwarf photosphere. And the black uh, spectrum and its residuals show this large amounts of gaseous uh, or extra absorption, which is due to gaseous material in orbit around this white dwarf.
And not only do we get these great profiles, but they also seem to vary over time. And this has been modeled by uh, two groups of uh, authors as again, a procession of a gaseous debris disk. And you can see that the emission profiles over, a, uh, sorry, absorption profiles over a year change from a red shifted, uh, mostly dominated profile to a blue shifted. And the reason you can explain this with an eccentric orbit that's processing is that your line of sight cuts through a particular part of the disk. And as the disk processes, we get information of different slivers of this disk. And because the orbits are eccentric, you have a radial velocity component that you can add on and maneuver, uh, allow these profiles to shift from blue to red. And thanks to this procession, we can start to, we can kind of study this system in more detail and kind of constrain the location of the gas uh, much better than if we don't have this kind of information. I just wanted to kind of show a quick example um, showing the location of this gas. Uh, this blue box is just highlighting uh, 50 uh, on the X and Y axis, 50 white dwarf uh, radii. And most of the gas in this system, there's a caveat to that, mo but most of the gas in this system seems to occupy, uh, live in this space. Whereas for the other system that I was showing earlier, the one with a very subtle uh, absorption profile, uh, was kind of has been uh, located to roughly 100 white dwarf radii by Steele et al. Um, but the location of this, these uh, gaseous components are kind of in very different regions. They're, they're kind of like, this is the 50 white dwarf radii location. And the system here on the left also doesn't really show any infrared excess. So it's without dust. So the kind of where this gas comes from, as well as the debris disks uh, with gaseous emission, only five to 10% of those systems show emission. It begs the question as to where this gas comes from. And so one of the first models proposed to kind of generate gas in these systems uh, was proposed by Ravikov and Metzger. Uh, and they took this optically thick, geometrically thin disk uh, of disk of solids of, of dust. And as this material reaches the sublimation point, this uh, sublimates and the gas falls onto the white dwarf. But due for angular momentum conservation, some of this gas needs to go into the disk. And this induces extra drag on the dust, which then brings in more dust to the sublimation point. And this leads to a runaway uh, generation of gas. And so at least for the systems that show uh, dusty debris, you'd expect this to exist more or less in all of those systems. And so if we're seeing debris and gas, it, we might have a chance alignment with the disk um, and that we're seeing circumstellar absorption material. But it's, uh, it's harder to explain the gaseous emission systems and why they're so rare. Um, are we seeing them in a special phase? And more recently with the debris disk observations that I was showing earlier from Swan et al, there is variability both increasing and decreasing in brightness. Uh, almost stochastically, which is kind of hard to explain by just generating gas at the sublimation radius. And so um, it's been suggested that the stochastic destruction and production of this dust in an optically thin uh, medium um, can explain the observations uh, and uh, this destruction and production is come about, comes about through collisions. And there have been three kind of models that could explain this variation, both the production and destruction of dust and also the presence of gas. So collisional cascades have been proposed where you have large rocky bodies that are kind of undergo cascades of collisions and grind themselves down into dust, which generates a large amount of dust and gas. It's also been suggested that a body in, uh, embedded in the disk could either be directly or indirectly causing collisions with the smaller dust grains, uh, destroying dust and generating gas. And finally, it's been suggested that if you have a pre-existing dust disk and you have a tidal stream impacting on this disk, then you could be just again destroying dust and generating gas. Uh, but with this one, you can very easily see that this kind of angle difference can push dust out into a nice halo, which is a nice optically thin component that can then lead to dusty variability. And so I hope from all of this, you can see how, oh, sorry, one more thing. <laughs> so. One other thing that is also really nice about these systems is not only that can we study the kind of formation mechanisms, but we can also study their evolution thanks to gaseous uh, debris disk precession. But why do these disks precess? So Miranda and Ravikov proposed that if you have an eccentric gas disk, then it will precess uh, due to general relative stick precession and gas pressure forces. Um, but you need a driving mechanism for the eccentricity so it can precess. Uh, because if there is no driving mechanism for this eccentricity, it should be damped out on relatively short timescales. Um, 
So one mechanism that has been proposed is that if you have one of these embedded planetesimals in the disk, it could be driving that eccentricity and keeping the eccentricity of the disk as well as possibly also generating the precession and the, the variation that we see in the gas and the dust. But that's fairly preliminary, fairly speculative. Um, but I hope that at least from this kind of part of my talk and also looking to the future, that these systems are really interesting, really dynamic, and can tell us a lot about white dwarf planetary systems. So we should find more, we should try and find more of these. We know of 21 emission systems and five that have absorption in gas. And um, one system overlaps this, this kind of link. And by modeling the precession, which is great to see that we have this, uh, we can use methods such as Doppler tomography to get exquisite insight into the structure and evolution of these disks. And also with the dust variability, start to explore debris disk generation scenarios. And so for the last little bit of my talk, I want to explore something else, which is what two groups have been leading this uh, work, is that photonize, photo ionization modeling of the, of the disk, both modeling circumstellar absorption of gas and circumstellar emission of gas, can help us understand the composition of uh, exoplanetary material accreted by a white dwarf. So the circumstellar absorption has been led by Steele et al. Uh, and the modeling of the emission has been led by Gansak et al. And I wanted to focus on the, the latter one because it kind of fills in the trio of gas systems that I've classified here in that this system shows emission and no dust. So it's just gas uh, in emission. And the material that you can see here in emission, you have uh, hydrogen, oxygen and sulfur in emission. And this is high, this is very volatile, rich material. And the authors uh, interpreted this that you have a close in giant planet, possibly a Neptune or a strip Neptune that is orbiting around the white dwarf. And the white dwarf is hot enough that it can photo evaporate that atmosphere, which then forms the accretion disk that we see and ultimately pollutes the white dwarf. And the part of this study that I wanted to focus on is that the authors use the kind of general uh, method of measuring exoplanetary abundances, which is looking at the white dwarf photosphere and modeling the lines that you see in the photosphere due to the planetary uh, abundances. And so you can see oxygen and sulfur fitted in the atmosphere. But they also use the photo ionization modeling code called Cloudy to model the disk, which is shown on the right. So you can see the disk data in black and the model in red. And this fits the data well. And they were able to show that the composition of the disk and the composition in the accreted material, uh, at least for sulfur and oxygen, agree with a factor or two, which is really cool. And I just want to go slightly more in detail on this. So I'm showing uh, a composition plot where we have hydrogen, calcium, nitrogen, and kind of volatile rich elements or volatile like elements on the left and the more rocky building elements on the right. And on the Y axis, uh, if we have a composition uh, of, of a body, this is then kind of divided by bulk earth or compared to bulk earth. So if you're rocky or bulk earth like, then you should largely sit along this kind of along the line and be flat. But the material in this uh, disc and the photosphere of this white dwarf, the blue and red points um, and, up, and the kind of upper limits, show that this material is heavily uh, volatile rich or enhanced compared to bulk earth and especially from the disk uh, constraints heavily depleted in rocky materials this is really accreting a volatile rich uh, body um, and this is i think this is really cool and the, also the work by steel et al modeling the circumstellar absorption really shows us the power that these disks can teach us about white dwarf uh, planetary systems and their accretion and I just wanted to kind of end uh, showing my favorite system, SDSS 1228. And we have a really nice, uh, photo, there's really nice photospheric modeling of the atmosphere of the white dwarf to learn about the exoplanetary composition. But we also really have really nice emission profiles from multiple elements. We have calcium, oxygen, magnesium, iron. And we can use photo ionization modeling to model this disk and compare it to the photosphere. And we can start to see if there, if for multiple of these systems, are there any systematic differences in the uh, modeling of the photosphere that may need to be accounted for thanks to modeling of the disk? Um, what could be more exciting is that uh, in the, one of the scenarios I was talking about earlier, you have material impacting on a pre-existing disk. Then could the disk have a different composition to that of the photosphere? Um, I think that'd be pretty cool to see. Um, and I hope that over all of this talk, I've kind of uh, shown you that these systems are really interesting and we should really be studying these systems. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what everyone else is going to be doing in the years to come. And I, I will end my talk there. So thanks for listening and I'll take any questions. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, are there any questions for Chris?
I see Wolfgang. Hi. Um, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so I've, I've been I've been thinking about your asymmetric disks when you first mentioned them. I thought, like, what the hell? Um, so I didn't quite understand and probably mentioned it, and I'm just not an expert in this field. Um, is this could this be because it's flying? Is this driven by it flying to I, through ISM, or is this something completely different? Why did I miss the point? Uh, sorry, is the question why is the disk processing? Why is it eccentric? Yeah, why is it is it is it processing because like oh it's flying through the ISM and that drives it? I didn't I didn't get that point. Oh sorry, yeah. So we, we don't have we don't assume any interaction with the ISM. Um, the disk appears to be eccentric, and a few of these appear to be eccentric. Um, and well, one of the mechanisms I think could be driving this eccentricity is if you have a, a planetesimal in the disk that is on a, an eccentric oh, orbit, and okay, okay. As that is going through the disk, it generates gas, and that sits on that eccentric orbit and possibly circularizes or condenses into the, it condenses into the disk. Uh, but the the it's still an open question as to what is driving the eccentricity in these systems. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dan, Annie. Yes. Um... In, uh, in the, the systems that have gone through a full precession orbit, does the, does the line, the disk profile, does it recover exactly or approximately? Uh, so from what, what I've seen, uh, there's uh, one, only one system has gone through that. And it appears approximately that they, it seems to agree. We've seen it kind of going back and forth. Um, with um, with the, ver the first one I was showing, that, that the movie I was showing, um, we've only seen basically half a cycle. Um, but with that assumption, we should, if you've gone exactly 180 degrees, you should see an exact mirror image of the disk of the emission profiles, because all the red shifted material should be then blue shifted. And in that, we still see some slight differences that may be telling us that the assumption that it's exactly a fixed image is not quite true. But overall, it seems to be that the overall disk does seem to be varying um, and processing with a, an overall fixed uh, pattern. And there's some small scale variations in there. Thank you. Um, Brian? Hi, hi Chris. Uh, thanks for the overview. I, I have, haven't been following this field as closely as I should be, so this is great. Um, I was going to ask you about this, this uh, time variable uh, IR emission and how it connects, if, if, if any way, to the eccentric, so what phase of the uh, eccentric gaseous disk? Do you have systems where you can? correlate this IR variability. I guess I'm wondering what are the thoughts in the context of these processing gas models for what's, uh, you know, causing the IR variability? Um, can, can the same perturber be exciting dust in the disk uh, in a phase-dependent way? Or what are the thoughts on on, on that aspect of things? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that uh, I've gone blank. Yeah, so I think the, the kind of the production of dust um, appears to be largely stochastic um, in these systems. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, any link of kind of like a periodic signature or anything in these systems. I think having a perturber in the disk could induce some stochastic variation in dust and generate this gas. So the gaseous emission systems, um, most of the stuff that was in the kind of first half of the talk, um, a lot of them do show what seems to be stochastic variation in the strength of the emission. Um, so some systems show 20 to 30 percent variability, but there's been some systems where we see in the emission appear and then disappear over time scales of months or years. And so there seems to there does seem to be a link between the presence and stochastic variability of dust and the presence of emission profiles that also show some variation in their strengths. Um, but that's I, that's still a kind of like piecing those together is still in process. I think you kind of have two pictures: one of of a perturber in the disk that's kind of there long term excitingness, and then the other where you're adding new you know chunks of <laughs> disrupted planet uh, and and generating dust stochastically. But it seems like there may be some connection there, so it's 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 interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, thank you. That's right. Are there more questions? If not, I have one, and that is um, the the one system with transits WD1145 has gas and absorption, but 
we know there's gas, but it doesn't have emission lines. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the one that has this very, very narrow, weak calcium H and K absorption. Is it surprising that these systems don't have emission lines as well? Does it tell us something about the location of the gas? I don't know. It's, that's interesting to, to why these systems don't show that. And there is one system that does show both absorption and the emission, the 1228, the one I, with the processing model. Um, it could be that in, especially with WD1145, we are seeing this disk most likely edge on because we're seeing transiting material. So it could just be that we're seeing a lot of the material that would be in the sublimation radius. And it just it is just that chance alignment. And there isn't a process going on that would be generating a uh, gas emission that's co-orbital with the dust. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the, the kind of location of the disks, uh, the, at least the circumstellar absorption, does seem to be less constrained just because we don't have as much information from the kind of thin slivers. Um, 1145 is a bit of an exception as it, it seems to be processing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Last chance for any questions? There's one from Evan. Great. So uh, this might be a kind of unfair question for Chris, but uh, just big picture, and you're probably the best the best person to an answer because I don't know who really would be. But I've been wondering a lot about um, sort of what we know about how material eventually arrives on the white dwarf. It seems like there's a lot going on with the dusty part of the disk now that people are understanding better, and a lot has been done sort of at the photosphere of the white dwarf in between. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not clear on if we really understand, and I'm wondering if you know, or, or if you have any any thoughts on like what your what your research is telling us about how material might eventually arrive at the white dwarf, whether it's you know about the geometry of that or the the time scales, or you know if do you think there's a lot of variability in the accretion onto the eventual photosphere, or yeah, big picture questions. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so uh, it seems from most observations, we don't really, there's not really been any very conclusive evidence of like here's variability in the photospheric observations. And we have some data from HST on uh, the SDSS-1228, the one with the, the processing uh, Doppler tomogram. And as far as we can tell over the time scale of years, the, the photospheric absorption seems to be exactly the same. There doesn't seem to be any variability. Um, but what could be happening, or at least what I think might be happening in these disks is that you have the dust and gas being very, fairly variable, but this, at least in the systems that show emission, this is happening in the dusty component of the disk. And you're having a level amount of dust that's being kicked out and kind of maybe turned into gas and being destroyed. But you could also have a component that is, um, uh, what's the word? Condensing gas back into dust, which was kind of uh, discussed in uh, Brian's paper in 2012 and has been discussed in other papers since. Um, and that could lead to a, thing, a phase where kind of you're condensing gas back into dust. And this is then not the gas that's being accreted by the white dwarf and can maybe help explain why we don't see such large variability in the uh, accretion rates. But it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. And that's only, I mean, that's one interpretation and I'm sure other people have others. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, Chris, for the for this nice talk. And I think we can then move on to the last talk of the session. Oh no, there's a question by Beth. By Beth. So Chris, you're not off the hook yet. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Chris. Great talk. Um, so in 2008, Mike Jura wrote a paper about um, the potential for dust pro uh, du for gas production by sputtering if you have multiple objects coming in at different inclinations, which you've sort of um, uh, talked about a more modern version of that. And that helped explain at the time why you might see um, dust in some systems, but have a lot of, but have accretion in a wide range of systems. Why don't we see dust in all of them? And the thinking was that it could be multiple, um, multiple accretion events are occurring and that when you do see dust, rather it's a single object. Has that changed at all in what you've learned? Um, 
just so I understand correctly, there's the kind of the comparison between having like one large body come in and then multiple bodies that could be changing the composition. Yes. Or very different composition bodies. So I, I uh, the so way the, I've been thinking. The I'm sorry. dusty ones. Sorry, just to, the dusty ones are the highest accretors in yeah. general. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. so you know maybe the ones that are, are accreting but not at such a high rate are the result of uh, ongoing um, impacts, mm -hmm. steady flow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, possibly, yeah, because I mean, it, it is a question as to why only one to three percent of systems show the dust, but we have up to fifty percent that are polluted, and so it could be that those smaller systems are um, accreting uh, lots of smaller different bodies. It'd be interesting with these large debris disks, the ones that show this high uh, accretion rates, if there is a difference between the accreted uh, material in the atmosphere and the disk, because I mean, if if there was a difference and a clear difference, then that would be a clear indicator that something different has been accreted than what's in the disk. Uh, but my, my thoughts are it's, they're probably mostly going to be the same. That what's in the disk and what's being accreted. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris.